Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit, and it's been such a long time um, since the three of us have met. But I'm going to bring in Mr. Michael Brown of Pepperstone and Mr. Richard Matthews of One Dot IO. Gentlemen, how are you? Good to see you all. Very well, Blake. Good afternoon to you. It's been uh, far too long, I would say, since we uh, we last did one of these. It has. Yeah, been. We're meant to be doing the monthly, weren't we? We were, you know, we were trying to do it and, you know, summer crept up on us and yeah, the central yeah. bank meetings and, you know. And then Richard, someone went to the south of France to yeah, take he's photographs in the south of, of France, yeah. all the rest of it. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, well, you know what? It is really nice to have you guys here, especially, um, you know, coming off the Bank of uh, Bank of Canada today. Um, uh, but I, I think we have a lot to catch up on. Um, and anything from uh, the the Trump assassination attempt, and you know, obviously the 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 U.S. political environment starting to get literally heated up. Um, we've got a couple central banks meeting. You 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 had uh, the Labour Party, uh, you know, um, uh, win there in the U.K. I, I want to hear what you guys' thoughts are on that. And uh, you know, we've seen this massive move in the yen over the course of the last couple of days, uh, or maybe the last like week or two. And so, I'd love to get your pulse on that. And then, Richard, I'm going to come back to you about crypto. So, don't think you're going to get off scot free <laughs> regarding that. But uh, let's start, and and uh, maybe uh, I'm going to start with you, Michael, really quick, just since we're we're fresh off the Bank of Canada meeting. Uh, the 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 Bank of Canada they actually cut rates, um, but. You know the the dollar cad's struggling at the one thirty eight level. What are your thoughts uh, following the Bank of Canada here? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one actually. I mean, the, the the rate cut was fully expected both on the sell side and in terms of market pricing. I think it was priced about ninety odd percent chance. So no real surprise that it hasn't impacted um, dollar cad. I, I think what's perhaps more interesting is that the BOC haven't really done anything, and I must have I haven't seen remarks from the the press conference, but in the statement at least they haven't really done anything to push back against market pricing, which is uh, around about forty five basis points more cuts before the end of the year and I think the biggest takeaway for me is that this is a much more rapid pace of easing than we're seeing certainly from uh, south of the border in the US where you are uh, but also elsewhere in 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 the G10 uh, central banking world and the data justifies the BOC taking this more aggressive pace. Inflation has come down quite nicely. Consumption is weak and the labor market is loosening quite quite rapidly. Um, but you would argue that, you know, if they deliver what the market is pricing, that is uh, a much more rapid clip of policy normalization than we're seeing elsewhere. And you'd expect that will pose some fairly chunky headwinds to the Canadian dollar over the, the rest of the year at the very least. You know, one of the things that, that I'm going to uh, that's it's kind of hung with me for the last couple of months is the very, very outsized short positioning in in, in Canadian, um, you know, futures, Canadian dollar futures shorts. And I mean, it, it it is basically saying that the speculative market really is looking for a move above 140 and beyond. Um, and it's the most aggressive they've had in in in, in history uh, right now. But it it almost looks like and it feels like based on this divergence between uh, the Fed and the Bank of Canada, that that is entirely possible in the in the months ahead. What do you say? No, I, I I fully agree. I mean, it, it looks like I'm sure Dick will pipe up in a second with his talk about rate hikes as usual. Um, but uh, <laughs> it looks like the Fed are, are pretty much nailed on to cut in September um, and then probably again in, in December. So 50 basis points. Uh, in 2024 from the Fed, 100 basis points from the BOC. You're probably looking at 75 from the ECB. Naturally, you, you would expect the dollar to, to appreciate against those currencies if, if everything else remains equal, of course. Well, let, well, you, you you spun it over to to Mr. Matthews. Let's talk to him. Let's talk to you real quick, Dick. About Ooh, almost uh, like we've done this before, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But let, let's <laughs> talk about the Fed. And, um, you know, it's an interesting one, right? I mean, you have the Fed. No one's, everybody's expecting uh, rates to stay unchanged next next week. But for September, people, you know, the market's still pricing a cut. But you obviously are not there. Give me your thoughts on what how you feel about the dollar and the Fed right now. Uh, I like the dollar. I agree, absolutely agree with Michael. I think that the Canucks have got ahead of themselves. They're going to keep on cutting. They've seen something they don't like. I disagree with policy normalisation. Why is cutting rates policy normalisation? Rates at this level are, are quite normal and they should be accepted as normal, but that's by the by. That's for us to discuss over lunch. 
before I pay and you agree with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, uh, I am actually starting to change my mind about the dollar. Uh, sorry about about um, interest rates in in the states. Those home new home sales figures were absolutely dire, weren't they? I mean, it's just like, what's happening there? Why is it suddenly just hissable? <laughs> no idea. I think that the economy is starting to slow down. I think they will cut in August. If they don't, uh, sorry, I think they will cut in September. Uh, if they don't, I think they're going to run out of time ahead of the election because it just becomes too political. So I think that's probably their last chance to, to have a go at it. I still don't think uh, inflation's dead. I think that you'll they won't cut as much as people think. I'm loath to say they will cut, but I think they will cut now. Um, but again, you know, they're going to cut less, I think, than the ECB and, and, and the Bank of Canada. Uh, England's another completely separate issue. Well, you know, I, I know the Bank of England is next week, so let, let's let's stick with you, Dick, real quick, because uh, obviously the Labour Party is in charge, uh, and uh, and this has been the first time in is it fourteen can or thirteen you, years? Sorry, Blake, can, yeah. can you stop reminding us of that? We, yeah. we, we, we've only Please. just got over it, it ourselves, you know. We know <laughs> it. <laughs> well, Dick, tell tell us tell us how you see the future of not only the UK uh, with the new leadership, but also mm -hmm. how does it play into your Sterling, um, you know, uh, analysis at this point? Well, we are a haven of political stability in, a, in an unsettled world, aren't we? We've got a, a stable government, a Labour government, which is uh, going to be interesting. They've already had a rebellion in their ranks. It's less than two weeks they've been in power. They've suspended was it six uh labor mps last night from the party for voting against the policy but actually all joking aside like them or loathe them it does look like a stable government compared to europe where france is going through god knows what i think they're miles away from getting any sort of agreement there you've got the far left and they really are far left uh, uh compared to the uk or the far right i actually end up i think that le pen will end up in charge there funnily enough well, that's quite a controversial view. And then, of course, the, the States isn't exactly politically stable after you know the attempted assassination on Trump. So from a political point of view, the UK looks OK. Uh, I quite like cable. Well, I do, do like cable. I like sterling over the, the euro as well for those reasons, for, uh, politically. Uh, I'm not sure when the Bank of England will cut. One thing that has come out, and I don't know whether Michael agrees with me on this, that they're talking about some pretty hefty pay rises for the public sector, for teachers and for nurses, of five and a half percent. Wage prices, uh, wages are still in, uh, growing much too quickly over here, in my opinion. Service inflation is still too high. I don't see the Bank of England actually can find a window to cut. Uh, if they do, it's going to be real late on in the year. It might be October, November. So I think they're going to be the last ones to join that party. I don't know what what you think, Michael. Um. Yeah, I, I'm really struggling with the the August um, BOE to have any sort of degree of conviction over what the MPC are, are likely to do. Um, my gut feeling is is very similar to yours in that you know they they're not going to be able to cut this time around. I, I think they wanted to. I think if you look at the the June decision, we had obviously the the seven two vote in favour of keeping rates unchanged, but it was apparently a finely balanced decision for some. On the MPC to hold rates steady, which would imply that you know that if they had an excuse to cut, then they would do so. But again, you look at the data, and it's just such a a mixed bag here in the UK at the moment. On the inflation side of things, headline CPI is at target. Great, let's celebrate. You dig into the release, core CPI is running at 3.5% and services CPI is running at 5.7%. And the, the latter measure is about six tenths of a percent above the BOE's own forecast. So the inflation data is a, a, a complete mess. You go to the labor market side of things and unemployment's at four spot 4%, I believe, which is uh, its highest level since 2020. 21 and you go that points to a rate cut but then you look at earnings and as dick rightly said you've got um earnings growing at just shy of six percent on an annual basis and a lot of reports in the press here of public sector pay rises in in, in this year being above inflation which certainly isn't going to help um 
You then go to the consumption side of the economy. You look at um, retail sales, very, very weak in the, the last print, falling about a percent and a half in, in June. Um, but then you look at housing and the housing market seems relatively firm when, when you look at the data and also when you talk to, to, to people involved in that anecdotally, everything seems to be going along OK. So I, I think the BOE are in an interesting spot. I, I think there's probably enough in the data such that if they wanted to deliver a rate cut next week next thursday they can um whether that would be a wise decision personally i don't think it would but i think the boe have got a bit of a problem in terms of logistics and in terms of timing because when they do cut rates i think they're likely to want to do what every other central bank has done and deliver that first rate cut in line with one new economic forecasts and two a press conference to explain that decision and the boe don't have another forecast round and don't have another press conference until november so if they don't cut in august they're waiting another three three and a half months with bank rate at five and a quarter percent and i think that may perhaps lead them to deliver a rate cut this time around but Hmm. In all honesty, I've got no bloody idea what they're going to do next week. And I would wager that most of the NPC don't have a clue either. <laughs> well, 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 we have monetary policy divergence pretty much across the board. And, and that speaks to the Fed. Um, well, actually, you know, actually, let's 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 speak to the Bank of Japan. Let's go there. And uh, Michael, I'm going to stay with you because um, I know you focus on the end more than Richard does, per se. Um, Richard might have a few things to say about this, but we've seen a massive move in the yen. Um, you know, following the intervention, uh, we, we've, we've got now, um, you know, just kind of an accelerated move uh, based on some JGB, you know, potential shifts in, 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 uh, in, in buying from the Bank of Japan and Ministry of Finance. What do you make of this? Because we are getting very, very close to a key level in the dollar yen that's been a major level for for better part of a year, which is about the 152 uh, level. Uh, we're getting pretty close. What what do you think we do with the BOJ or excuse me, with the dollar yen or the yen in general with the BOJ just, you know, coming up this next week? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting one. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm actually tempted to say that the Ministry of Finance's intervention in the yen has finally quote unquote, worked. Um, and the reason I say that is not because dollar yen is trading seven big figures off the highs that we saw. The reason I say that is because it seems like what the intervention has done is actually stamp out quite a lot of the speculative activity that we've seen in the market. Um, and that's not just in the yen. Actually, I think some of this carry trade that we saw in the FX space is starting to unwind a little bit more broadly. The Swissy, for example, has been quite strong lately. Um, and if you look at some of the Latin American currencies, they've been trading relatively soft, which helps to, to support that idea. Um, and you could even extend that into the equity space. I mean, we're, we're recording this obviously on a day when the NASDAQ future is down as near as makes no difference, 3% on almost no news, um, which again speaks perhaps to a little bit of a, a position unwind going on. So I think the MOF will be pretty pleased with, with their handiwork at long last, although they spent, you know, nigh on $10 trillion to get to that point. Um, <laughs> what, what I would say um, in terms of the Bank of Japan, though, is again, I think this is a very, very finely balanced decision. Obviously, we had those sources reports from Reuters uh, earlier this morning, I believe leave, saying that they will discuss a hike. Uh, Bloomberg was saying the other day that a hike is a close call and the, that officials are concerned about the consumption data that they're getting. Um, but again, you know, the, the other question with the BOJ, of course, is what's the magnitude of the hike? Is it 25 basis points? Is it 15 basis points? Is it 10 basis points? We don't know. Um, and of course, there's still the open question, of course, around what they do with their bond purchases. Do they announce a plan to, to trim those? Um, but I think if we do get uh, a relatively hawkish decision from the BOJ. Of course, that comes UK time, at least on Wednesday morning with the Fed on Wednesday evening. Um, then that is only going to to spur on the, the bears in terms of dollar yen, um, because momentum is is clearly in their favor at this moment. Yeah, very, very true. You know, um, uh, uh, staying staying along the lines of uh, of, of, of central banks um, and, and the BOJ uh, specifically, I wanted to get your thoughts really quick on, you know, this unwind. You say it's, 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 you know, looks like a lot of it's been done, but Michael, you've been a very, very staunch 
stock market bull. Every time you do the trade-off show, the UK trade-off show with my colleague, Ryan Littlestone, you've just been a, a bull in the stock market, rightfully so. Um, and it looks like today things are starting to roll over. Richard, I am going to come back to you because I want to get your uh, views on the equity markets right now. But equities look a little soft here, and it looks like we might be d due for a bit of a, a pullback in equities. Um, how do you feel about the US equity markets right now as a whole? Yeah, um, I'm not overly concerned, to be completely honest with you. I mean, as you say, it does look like we are getting, um, well, undeniably, we are getting a pullback. I mean, the S&P is you know, 4% off the highs that we saw uh, last week, just looking at a chart here, and the, the NASDAQ is uh, uh, around about 7% off those highs. And actually, the, the NASDAQ future just trading below its 50-day its moving average as we speak, which may have actually spurred some of the, the further selling that we've seen um, as the, the session has progressed. But I, I'm, I'm not overly worried. I mean, you know, as you say, I have been bullish for pretty much the entire year. But while being bullish, I've also been saying that, you know, it, it, we can't rule out um, a, a dip or a, a pullback. But I still see those dips and pullbacks as, as buying opportunities. I mean, the, the bull case that, that I've been, been working with has been based on economic growth remaining resilient. And, and I think most people would say that, that that is the case. Obviously, we get um, second quarter GDP from the United States during Thursday's trade. Um, by extension, that should lead to earnings growth remaining relatively resilient. And I think you could argue that that's still the case, although guidance has been perhaps a little bit soft. And obviously, Tesla disappointed yesterday, which won't be doing much for, for sentiment, particularly in terms of the, the Magnificent Seven and, and, and the NASDAQ more broadly. And then lastly, of course, you, you've got the Fed put, which remains firmly in place. I mean, we're, we're going to see a cut in September. We will probably see um, a cut in December. And Powell himself saying how risks to the dual mandate are now back in much better balance and that the labor market is, and I think his words were, essentially no tighter than it was in 2019. And of course, what were the Fed doing in 2019? They were delivering what they were at the time calling insurance rate cuts uh, prior to the pandemic. Of course, no one knew that that was on the horizon, but in order to try and engineer a soft landing. And that's exactly what they're doing once more this time around. So, um, yeah, obviously, you know, as a bull, you don't like to see equities coming lower, uh, but certainly not ripping up that theory just yet. All right. And Richard, you know, you, you, you've been around for a long time uh, and, and we've, we've seen the markets and <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice way of saying he's old, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what, Richard, and, and look, I'm not too far behind you. And that's the, that's the thing that I, I do want to point out, but Richard, we've seen a lot of different markets and this has been probably one of the more unique markets environments that we've seen in the last couple of years. What do you make of valuations of U.S. equities. I mean, hell, you could even talk about the FTSE right now, or or, or maybe maybe the DAX. What do you make about equity market valuations at, at at current levels, based on your experience and what you've seen in your in your in your years of trading? Uh, I think they're loony. I've got to say, <laughs> I think they're, they're out of all kilter to reality. But having said that. You know, the stock markets are driven by seven stocks in the States, and I'm sure they pull the rest of the world up with them. Uh, looking, I agree with what Michael says. I think you're going to see this is a dip. I don't think it's going to be a massive sell off, and it's probably a buying opportunity because whoever wins, whether it's Harris or, or Trump, is not going to damage the stock market. There's only going to be positive, I think. Um, so fundamentally, I still think it's, it's a buy. It has, however, come an awful long way pretty quickly in a straight line. You know, valuations, I, know, I I just think they're loony. But if the NVIDIA comes comes out and is the, the panacea for everything in the world, then that's fantastic. The valuation is correct. But, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced. But then that's old age making me grumpy and, and cynical. <laughs> All right. Well, the other thing, well, just... Just Go very, ahead. very, very quickly on, yeah. on X's. I know we've, we've gone on for, for a while on that. Um, I, I think just the time of year is something important to bear in mind. You yeah. know, we, we are right at the end of July. People are either on or about to go on relatively long summer holidays. Um, and you probably won't be dealing with, you know, full volumes and quote unquote normal liquidity um, until Labor Day for you guys, which is obviously early September. So perhaps that is just limiting 
conviction a little bit in terms of stepping in to, to buy the dip because obviously you know people are going to be effectively looking to de-risk their book before they go on that holiday yeah. rather than looking to take on a load of risk and then leave the desk for three weeks on on friday afternoon yeah it makes and that also makes also right. exaggerate the, you know, the thinness of the markets will exaggerate the moves anyway yeah of course yeah, yeah. Sure. All right. Well, before I let you go, um, Richard, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to uh, bring us in so all of us can see each other again. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about Bitcoin or crypto in general. I mean, you, you we just recently saw an ETF rollout for, for Ethereum. Um, you know, you got the Trump trade, if you will. He's he's tends to be pro pro crypto. You've got uh, Bitcoin still struggling to make it above 70,000. Um what do you how, how how are you seeing things because you're over at one dot io uh, the trump trade i think trump is fundamentally very pro crypto actually i i, I presume he's got some stopped away somewhere god knows how what harris harris's view on it i think the market still fundamentally believes that trump will win and that may well be underpinning it uh I think there's still a lot of people out there who are worried about the geopolitical world and what's going on, and a lot of youngsters who actually will turn to crypto as opposed to turn to gold. So I think fundamentally it's pretty well... <laughs> youngsters, <laughs> excluding Michael, <laughs> <laughs> who who actually probably wouldn't even buy gold, um, who look at it as a store of value, with the US devaluing the dollar the whole time by, you know, just the amount that it's borrowing and, and the debts that it's running up, I think there's that groundswell of, of feeling towards that. Trump will want to devalue the dollar as well, I suspect, to make imports, uh, to make the exports look better. So I think there's just that little bit underwriting, the, underpinning the market, sorry. Uh, but again, it's thin. The, the, the markets are thin full stop, I think, because of because of summer holidays. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, it's it's going to Bitcoin. I mean, that's I'm I'm in the camp just so you guys know. I mean, I, I'm 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 in the uh, the 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 uh, LIFO camp. Last in, first out. Uh, you know, if 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 you're an institution and we really start, let's say we don't get a just a garden variety pullback in equities, Michael, we see 10 percent, maybe even a little bit more than that. Uh, going into this fall, I think a lot of new money has been in crypto, uh, in the crypto space over the last year or two. And I think you'll see that last in, first out. You know, I don't want to sell my Apple. Apple's like a utility company. Tesla's like one of the biggest automakers in the United States, you know, maybe even the world, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to keep that, but I'm going to sell my Bitcoin. So that's that's my view. So I'm going to be interested to see what yeah. price says, you know, in the future. But anyway... I just want to say I'm so happy to have you you both here because it's been it's been a, it's been at least like a month and a half and uh, and I, and it's all my fault so I'm going to make sure that I have you guys back and matter of fact you folks at home if you enjoy seeing Michael and Richard here make sure you give them a thumbs up jump in the comments down below especially if you don't agree with anything Richard has to say then please leave a comment down below uh, and. <laughs> Because obviously everyone will agree with everything. I everything, yeah, yeah, everybody absolutely. agrees with Michael. Yeah. I mean, come on now. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, we've got I, a I Labour want... government in the UK in case in case no one realizes that. <laughs> well, hey, you know, if, if people want to get more information on what you do in the crypto space, crypto Richard, space. what's the best way to follow your work? Uh, you can follow me uh, on Twitter at Dickie Matthews uh, with the five instead of the S or at one. Uh, and we're online on LinkedIn or just contact me through our website, which is one.io. And and Mr. Michael Brown, for your for your macro prowess in the markets, how do people, <laughs> traders, follow your work? Thank you, mate. Uh, yeah, on Twitter, Mr. M. Brown, uh, or go to pepstone.com and all of our research notes are, are posted there and links to the YouTube channel and, and all the rest of it are on the site. Awesome. Well, you guys, it has been really my pleasure having you both here. And I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the Trader Summit community. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful evening there in the UK. Thank you, mate. We will. Speak to you soon. Cheers, mate. Bye now. Hey, traders. Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, click the bell notifications so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.